Hello and welcome. I'm Peter, the host of Arcane Crime. I started this channel just over a month ago and I've already reached 1400 subscribers. This is still a small channel, but I've been very happy with how quickly it's grown. Most YouTubers have a much harder time getting started, and for that, I have every one of you to thank. So thank you for being here and for supporting the channel. As a sign of my gratitude, I decided to put together this Q&A video, and I must say I was very impressed with the quality and the intelligence of the questions that were submitted. Let's dive in. First question. I'd love to know more about what daily life looks like in the Bound Kingdoms. Is magic widely practiced, or is it more of a specific skill set? Both, honestly. Magic is widely used, but just because somebody uses magic doesn't make them a magician. People are only considered magicians or wizards or sorcerers if they are creating or innovating the magical fields. So if you are writing runes to make a spell that can be sold on the market, then you're a professional magician, but just purchasing a spell on a wand and casting the spell doesn't make you a magician in and of itself. My characters being detectives in the novel, they don't develop magic, so they don't consider themselves to be magicians even though they cast spells regularly as part of their job. Second question. What is the biggest inspiration for your story, movies, games, etc.? The biggest inspiration would probably have to be history, which I think is obvious from my videos, but the whole concept of my world was born when I read a biography of Isaac Newton and I learned that he had done a lot of research in alchemy, and I wonder what the world would have looked like if his theories around alchemy had worked out rather than his theories around calculus and gravity. In terms of my writing voice and story choices I make, I draw a lot of inspiration from non-English literature. I really love Spanish, Russian, Japanese, Chinese and Indian literatures. There's a lot of great writers from those countries and they had a lot of like really wacky weird story ideas that really were very mind opening to me. As far as like individual details for like what spells and potions and stuff that I come up with, I draw a lot of inspiration from word etymologies. There's a lot of like really interesting tiny pieces of history that are trapped in words that we're not really aware of. There's just a lot of really interesting details in our language that just bypass us every day. I also draw a a lot of inspiration from nature documentaries, a lot of magics that I come up with come from something I learned from watching like a David Attenborough documentary about like seals or something. Like my stretching disease that I talk about in my magic system video, that was inspired by a lemur in Madagascar that hunts bugs. It has really long sensitive fingers and when it taps the tree it can tell where on the tree bugs are living and so it can go find them just by sensing the vibration. I thought that was such a like a weird interesting concept and its hands look really freaky. My last Last major source of inspiration is probably my audience. Listening to your questions and seeing what people are curious about and want to know about, it helps me know where to focus as a storyteller as I'm working on the final draft of this book. I also see my viewers and future readers kind of like how a screenwriter sees actors, where I may be the originator of the world, but reading is an art form in and of itself. It's your interpretation of the world that really brings the world to life, and I think there's something very magical about that. So that sort of relationship relationship with my audience that I'm able to have because of platforms like YouTube, that is very inspiring to me and, and very motivating to me. Third question. How does the government of the Bound Kingdoms work? Is it the same as the United States or is there something more going on? It's very similar to the United States, but it has a much stronger influence from the European Middle Ages. So there are kings and queens who rule over the individual kingdoms. There is an emperor in place of the president, and the emperor is elected once every decade, but he is only voted on by the royalty of the individual kingdom. So it's much more of an oligarchy in that sense than the US is. There's no direct influence from the common folk to the ruling class in terms of who can govern them. That's the only real major difference. Fourth question. Have any wars had a different result in the world than in our world? Why and how did it affect the history of your world? I think my answer is not nearly as interesting as this question deserves to be. There were a couple of minor differences. They sort of make a passing appearance in the book. For example, uh, Prussia never fell as a country. That country still exists in Eastern Europe. The French Revolution worked out a little bit differently. Napoleon never came to power. The Vietnam War was part of the Third Great War. That was one of the conflicts going on. 
A lot of the wars were fought very differently, but the outcomes weren't significantly different. Like the first Great War, it was still a trench war, but it was much more devastating to the landscape, particularly in France. About a third of France is uninhabitable. Most of these are pretty minor details. Since my main series does take place in the Mountain Kingdoms, those details won't really be explored very much, but I might explore them at some point in the future when I finish the main series. Fifth question. Can we get a comprehensive guide to spells? What's Australia like in Arcane Crimes? And what will your next video be about? I'll start with the last question. The next video is going to take a deeper dive into the runic and glyph languages that are used to craft spells. That video will be coming about a week and a half after this video comes out. It will also introduce one of my favorite characters from the books, so keep your eyes peeled for that one. Can we get a comprehensive guide to spells? So spells are developed on an individual level. It would be kind of like trying to come up with a comprehensive list for every website that's on the internet, but with that there's a lot of spells that have repeat functions. There's like 50 to 100 different types of levitation spells that are all varying degrees of quality and built for different target audiences in mind. There are a couple of common rules and drawbacks that I'll go into in future videos. So sorry, I can't give a comprehensive guide to spells. What's Australia like? So... <laughs> I'm really glad you asked this actually, because Australia is my favorite piece of world building that I can't use in the books, uh, just because my books take place in America. But Australians really excel at manipulating water with magic. A lot of like the, the deep sea diving spells and those sorts of things were innovated by Australian magicians. They also developed this really cool suit called a basilisk suit. And the basilisk suit, it's named after uh, not like the mythological creature, but after basilisk basilisk lizards, which are the lizards that can run on water. They're made of an enchanted fabric that allow Australians to play their favorite sport. I need a good name for the sport right now. It's just called water ball. This sort of like rugby-like sport on the ocean. And they have a secondary team who wear something called shark suits and they swim under the basilisk runners and try to like pull them down into the water. It's a really fun, cool sport that isn't popular in the kingdoms, but it was a really cool innovation. So Australians, very good at water magic and they're very good with enchanted fabrics in particular that allow them to interact with the water differently. Sixth question. How do people in the present setting of your story imagine or think that their technology and magic will evolve in the future? So I'll give you a short, medium, and long-term goal that a lot of the thought leaders in the magic industry think the industry is going to go in. Short-term, they are looking for new energy sources. i was the most recently discovered magical energy source. That was 20 to 30 years ago, and they believe that there's something that could possibly be even more effective, um, and they're currently searching and digging for that. Midterm, they believe that it is possible to develop thought response spells, which are ones that have a brain implant to couple with it that allows the user to imagine a spell for the wand to cast without having to have a spell pre-coded into the wand itself. They don't have the infrastructure for that right now, but that could be something they achieve in the next 50 to 70 years from now. Potions are a very new field in the magical industry. Of the four magical energy sources, only i is safe to ingest, and so creating magically digestible consumables is relatively new but it has a ton of potential and they think that over the next hundred years they may even be able to develop a potion that allows people to temporarily generate their own magic question seven is space travel any different were they on the moon is there levitation or teleportation magic uh, so there is not teleportation magic that won't ever exist in this world. Levitation magic is used regularly, usually in industrial settings, but also like when people are moving and stuff. It's not used that whimsically or often, except for maybe when somebody gets a new wand and they're playing around with it. Space travel is different. I don't really want to take too deep of a dive into the technical differences right now. There was a moon landing. There are two stories about the moon, actually. I'll tell you one right now. I think I'll release the second one in a short later, maybe next week. But the first story, so the space race was going to happen in the 70s, but because of complications from the Third Great War, the space race was delayed and didn't take place until the 90s between America and China. That space race was a bit of a sham. China was terrified of upsetting America after the result of the Third Great War, so they pretended to compete with the states, but just barely lost. Great question.
Second. Question eight. Is there a large overview for the viewers of the channel to get an idea of what content to expect? So I'm going to continue doing these mini documentaries for a while. They will extend to a couple of months at least after the book comes out. At some point the book will eventually speak for itself, but I will be exploring this world for quite a while. I'll also be including videos that are individual character studies to help you get to know my characters. Eventually I plan on doing author vlogs to give you book updates and writing lessons, that sort of thing. Eventually I plan on expanding into different worlds as well, so this will not be the only world this channel explores but I don't plan on doing that this year. That will be at some point, maybe two or three years down the road. Question nine. What was your favorite book or series of books that you've read? If I had to choose a favorite book of all time, I would choose Collected Fictions by Jorge Luis Borges. He's by far my favorite writer, and he had so many wacky ideas that he explored in his short stories. I also really enjoyed The Hobbit and Narnia as a kid. I've only recently started reading sci-fi books, and I've been really enjoying those as well. Second. Question 10. How and from where is i extracted? What happens when i enters a person's body? Can runes be engraved directly onto humans or animals, for instance via tattoo? i is primarily extracted from precious metals, gold, silver, cobalt. Although there is a little bit of i in everything, those are just like the most i rich materials. What happens when i enters a person's body? So i is the only magical fuel that is safe to ingest, so it is used as the base component of any potion. Can runes be engraved directly onto humans or animals, for instance via tattoo? Like, a person can't basically use themselves as, as a human wand, but you can enchant tattoos to animate them or give them certain vocal effects. Technology around that is a little limited because when i is mixed with most tattoo inks, it becomes very toxic to most people. Well, not extremely toxic. It's not like poisonous, but people do have a very strong allergic reaction to it. Only about 2% of people can really have animated tattoos. Again, that's, that's very limited, and that will actually be explored in the book. It's very popular to use among criminals, and I'll actually be making a video like just about tattoos uh, at some point in the near future. Question 11. What are staffs like in arcane crimes? The majority of staffs are industrial sized wands, so contracting companies will use them to move heavy materials and levitate them to hold them in position like while they're like bolting everything together. Uh, so they're basically like giant industrial wands. There are a couple of very wealthy people who like the aesthetic of having a staff, and so they will have a wand like that that they'll encase in wood to make it look more traditional. They're basically very wealthy LARPers. Question 12. I am wondering if there is a reason that they do not dual wield wands. Maybe the wand in the offhand can only cast shield charms, so you have a sort of shield and wand combo. I mean, you can dual wield wands, absolutely. That's not the standard practice if you're in law enforcement or the military. Usually what they have is they'll have a wand and a gun together where the wand will be casting a shield and then the gun will be the weapon of choice. Because if you have two wands and one's serving the purpose of a shield, then you have to move a lot more with your free arm to cast attacks, whereas you can hide your gun hand much more effectively behind a shield since you don't need to move it as much, you just need to pull a trigger. In competitive combat sports, dual wielding wands is actually very common. Question Second. 13. Wait, so does this mean... It this is a world where the witch trials never happened, or did they? I would like to know. The witch trials of Salem, they happened only 30 years after magic was first invented, so there wasn't a ton of magic to influence how that history would have changed. The fallout was much more extreme, though. So in our world, the Salem witch trials ended the theocracy of colonial America and really established the separation of church and state. The witch trials still happened in the Bound Kingdoms, or in the colonial version of the Bound Kingdoms. And for the same reasons, uh, because of toxins in the environment, mass hysteria, psychology, all of those things uh, came together to contribute to that. I haven't talked about this yet, but this world has a much stronger anti-religious attitude. So religion, by the time my story takes place, has been dead for maybe 150 to 200 years. No one's religious anymore on the planet. And that was due in large part to the the, the witch trials. So they still happened, but it created a much stronger uh, anti-religious attitude than the ones in our world did.
Question 14. Given that the centaurs are all the results of magical grafting, can they reproduce naturally, and if so, how? Animals, people, or man-beasts? They basically go through a chemical or an all-chemical castration when they are created, so they cannot reproduce at all. Question 15. After Russia went pop, did the U.S. become a global tyrant and extract wealth from the world? Did countries like China develop their own Pandora's bomb to defend themselves? Do old cultures and customs have links to magic, such as traditional Chinese medicine, voodooism, Egyptian mummification, etc.? Are there druids on the moon? Yes, the Mound Kingdoms did become a global tyrant to some extent. They're not as dictatorial as they have power to be, but they are pretty horrible in some areas of the world. So in i rich countries, they're, they're very tyrannical um, because that's the most desired magical fuel that they're looking for. China, they do have a somewhat friendly relationship, but because of military magics that were invented during the Third Great War, they're very good at keeping tabs on efforts to create a Pandoran bomb in other countries, and they are very effective at assassinating any magicians who are attempting to create one. So no other countries have had an opportunity to really do that. Do old cultures and customs have links to magic? The inverse of that, I would say. So ancient cultures didn't have magic. They may have stumbled across Alkahest on accident, but never really understood how to utilize it in an effective way. But modern magic does take a lot of inspiration from ancient cultures, and they use it for their branding and the stylistic choices that they make in terms of how the magic is executed. Voodoo dolls do exist, but they were invented in like the 70s. They're highly illegal. That's something that's used primarily by cartels. Are there druids on the moon? So I'm actually going to be making a video about the moon landing. They do get to space, but there aren't aliens or anything like that. Um, and there was a very temporary settlement on the moon. But I will be making a video about that little chunk of history in two or three weeks from now. Question 16. Is the Mountain Kingdoms primarily or only humans, or are there other supernatural beings? So not in the traditional sense. There aren't supernatural beings like organically in this world. Humans can use magic to permanently advance themselves in some way, um, but those are very closely guarded government secrets. The only publicly known case of that is the Iron Service, which are the private guards and protective detail of the American emperor. As far as how they're created, we don't really know yet, but the outward result is that they have an alloy of metal that is not known or understood growing out of their skin, so they can't be touched by magic. So if you shoot a cursed bullet at them, then the bullet loses its effect on impact and doesn't and isn't strong enough to dent the armor. Question Second. 17. Do regular technologies we have today still exist? Like, is there still nuclear weapons or regular electricity, or is it undiscovered but eventually could exist? Or is it just complete replacements to our current technologies in that the other can't even exist? Magic is ultimately the fabric of this world's reality, similar to how electricity and atoms are the fabric of our reality. And so what can be created from them do look a little bit different. So electricity technically doesn't exist, although there is lightning. It just on an atomic and subatomic level, it looks very different in terms of how it operates. Same with nuclear weapons. Pandoran is the closest equivalent to nuclear in this world where nuclear is created by the splitting of the atom pandoran is created by ripping open the fabric of reality a very similar process but the outward result is very different second and that wraps up this q a session thank you all for coming and thank you for the wonderful questions you asked please hit the subscribe button and i'll see you next time